Father, we ask for a great uh, teaching here tonight and that your people uh, would uh, not be disconnected, nor would the enemy steal uh, any time from them here tonight during this next hour. And Father God, that there would be no distractions, uh, both here and online, and not only live, but also those that are watching later on. And Father God, that uh, your spirit would be in all the homes of everyone that's watching, and your spirit would dwell amongst us here, that we'd teach this uh, appropriately here tonight, according to the leading of your Holy Spirit, and that your presence, Father God, uh, would abound through all of us. Father, we also ask that for a special blessing on every gift and every giver, and all those that financially support this ministry. And Father God, let them know and let them see in their spirit what we are doing with the funds that they've been entrusting us with. And Father God, how well, how well we support not only the gospel, but the poor around the world. And Father, we thank you for that now in Jesus' name. Amen. And all God's people said, amen, amen. and amen. Welcome, take your seats here tonight. If you are watching live, we're glad to have you watching. Uh, just a little housekeeping, first of all. Uh, if you're watching on Facebook, go ahead and click share and share this with a bunch of people right now. Uh, we're going to be talking, i got a question here tonight, what is liberation theology? And I am prepared not only to answer that, but a lot of things that are surround that question. Um, so if you've ever heard of liberation theology, if you've never heard the terminology, you've seen it in action. And that's what we're going to be pointing to tonight. Then if we have time at the very end, Kathy's going to interview me again. And she's going to interview me concerning the miracles that this ministry has seen. And we've seen not only financial miracles, but healing miracles, people being raised from the dead, all kinds of cool stuff. So uh, that'll be an interesting topic. If we have time for that, we'll take care of that tonight. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, go ahead and click subscribe and also click the little bell and click the like button on there on the very end. I know what happens to these uh, videos after we put them up. We eventually go and we put them up into HD format because they're not going out HD even though we have HD equipment here and then once those are reformed we actually alert everyone if you have clicked on the bell we alert everyone that we just posted a video many times it's a video you've already seen but you didn't see it in edited format with scripture overlays and everything okay. else and so that happens weekly and so a lot of times if you go in there and make a comment you might not see your comment anymore it's not because we removed it it's simply because that video that was live uh, we put in the unpublished column and then we published the new edited version of what I was teaching. Uh, if you are, uh, so, and then if you're not even on uh, on YouTube, go over to YouTube, go to our website, mountainfaith.org, get into YouTube, just click subscribe so we can push our numbers up and you'll get informed when we're putting out new things. You know, and this is uh, one thing that I told people 20 years ago that we were going to do, 25 years ago that we were going to do, we were going to make our messages available for free. I didn't know how that was going to be possible 25 years ago, but now we're making our messages for free Amen. and available all around the world. You don't have to buy our messages unless you want them on DVD or a CD, which right. we, we still do a lot of. And maybe we'll have to come up with a new format shortly. <laughs> Who knows? Uh, my children will probably let me know. Yep. <laughs> uh, but anyway, we're going to have a great teaching tonight. The question here tonight, Kathy, is this. Uh, what is liberation theology? And uh, so when we are looking at a, a, a topic like this, as I was studying, I recognize that I just can't go in and define liberation theology, which now I can do uh, after, after this question came up. But I think there's a lot of other points to consider first. So this is a Bible study, so let's look at some things in our Bibles. Let's first of all talk about the history of deception. Now, when we see the word deceive or deceived or deceives or deception, uh, it might not be the same word in like the NASB or in the King James, it might be a different word. For example, uh, the word uh, deceived uh, in like Matthew is not deceived at all in the NASB, it's misled. And so when we're reading certain passages, we have to understand that deception may not be defined by the word deception, it may be defined by lied to or misled okay. or, or false prophecy or something. All right, so the first one is in Genesis uh, 3, uh, 13. Genesis 3, 13. Okay, if you just read that one verse and we'll briefly talk on it and move on to the next one. Then the Lord God said to the woman, 
what is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So Eve was deceived. And we find out later on that Adam wasn't deceived, but Eve was deceived. Not really a point of our teaching here tonight, but Eve was deceived. And any time a deception occurs, sin almost always follows. And so you must understand that we need to be able to spot deception. One of the th key things as we're going to be finding out here tonight, and I think it's important for us to talk about immediately, is deception is alleviated through the baptism of the Holy Spirit to a great extent. Uh, first of all, there's going to be what I call a gut feeling that something's not right when you have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, I could describe it in spiritual terms. I could say, well, the Holy, I had a stirring from the Holy Spirit inside of me. But a lot of people don't even understand what that is. So I can talk in street language and say, you're going to have a gut feeling. You're going to have a feeling in your gut. Something just isn't right. But it does not come unless you have the Holy Spirit or your angels. It, it's so dramatic that your angels are watching mm -hmm. uh, over that are watching over you to some extent, even unsaved, are trying to prevent you from getting in the trouble, being deceived, getting into a situation that's unhealthy in right. any form or format, maybe a, a sexually unhealthy uh, either relationship or encounter even. And so you'll get all kinds of warnings because angels know what's going on. Uh, even the angels of bad people are telling the angels of good people what the bad person is, is really up to. And so all the angels of God are conversing with one another. Let's go on to the next one in Deuteronomy chapter 11, Kathy. Deuteronomy 11, verse 16. Beware that your hearts are not deceived and that you do not turn away and serve other gods and worship them. All right. So this one line here shows us that the way people get into false doctrines and in deception in these days, even as Christians, is first of all, they have to be deceived. Amen. Amen. And so a, a lot of Christians say, I can't be deceived. I know Jesus. Wrong. You are so wrong. And that's, that's the thing that is a deception in and of itself. In fact, that's not just a deception. That's a deception based on pride. Amen. On. Pride is what caused the devil to fall. Pride is what brings in deception. So, oh, no, I'm, I'm too holy. I'm too righteous. I belong to too special of a group. This could not happen to me. Right. Let's go over to the next one. Let's go over to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3. Go all the way over to the New Testament there, Kath. 2 Timothy 2 Timothy 3, verse 1. But realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. Now jump down to verse 13. But evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. So one of the, one of the problems with impostors, see, he's talking about two groups of people, evil men and impostors. Now we can call impostors evil men, but, but the scriptures here are being very specific about what kind of evil person. Amen. An impostor is someone that comes into the church generally carrying a what is perceived to be a higher than normal rank or a very high rank maybe a prophet uh someone that calls himself a prophet maybe someone that calls himself an evangelist from other countries it doesn't always have to be that way but many times the word prophet or prophetess will be used by the individuals and you and i have had so much experience with false prophets but particularly you and i have had experience with false prophetesses yes women that claim to be prophets we knew it right away that they were not and either from their attire or their language uh something gave them away or just a gut feeling initially they gave them away we knew that they were not prophets so uh again uh, evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse deceiving and being deceived so someone that is deceiving other people is also going to be a victim of deception maybe not the identical deception right but it's it's uh, i tell people this the apostle paul talks about how, uh, uh, how having your conscience seared is with a hot branding iron. Imagine, if you would, a person that accidentally sticks something in their eye uh, and maybe a little pinprick. What a lot of people don't recognize, <laughs> last time I talked about this, people said, oh, I started closing my eyes in the sanctuary and looking up to the lights. 
I heard a couple people tell me that. They can go ahead and do that. They're not driving. Uh, but if you close your eyes and you're in the sun, you're going to see the damage your eyes have incurred all, after all these years. And many people don't even know that that happens. But if you close your eyes, you can see like a black spot where you know you, you know, touched your eye when you were a kid or something like that, or maybe oh. as an adult. Okay. Anyway, uh, those black spots are areas that cannot take in any light. That's why they're black. And you destroy your conscience the same way by deceiving other people. You actually prick your conscience or destroy it. Put a scar mark there on your conscience right. where you can be deceived. If you're deceiving spiritually, you can be deceived spiritually as well. All right. Now, uh, so that is the what we'll call a, a very quick history of of deception. All right. So the first thing that has to happen in order for liberation theology to take root is there has to be deception somehow. Deception doesn't happen overnight. It generally happens over a period of time. It could be a short period of time, but it's still a period of time. It could happen in our imagination, but it's still a period of time. Now, there are a lot of different people out there that have been teaching a Jesus that we just cannot identify in the Bible if we read about Jesus. So they're preaching Jesus, but not the Jesus that most of Christendom has accepted as true. So let's look at some verses. Let's go over to Matthew chapter 24 real quick. Matthew 24. And Matthew 24 is a great book of prophecy, but there's just a couple verses there. I want you to read, read verses 4 and 5 for me, Kathy. And Jesus answered and said to them, See to it that no one misleads you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will mislead many. Or will deceive. In both of those cases, mislead deceive, and mislead, right? those right. are deceptions. I don't like the term mislead. Uh, it may not have been the term that the, uh, the Greek was in, uh, but we see in other interpretations that says, let no one deceive you. All right, so uh, many will come in my name and will deceive many, as it says in some interpretations. So we see that. Let's go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And again, the question is, what is liberation theology? And we uh, want to look at three main points. The first main point is this, the basis for deception. The second main point is this, that there are people holding in their congregations or in their mindsets or in their little study groups a different Jesus than what Scripture points to. Okay. Second Corinthians chapter 11, read verses 3 and 4. But I am afraid that as a serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. All right. So here we see the, the very first time Eve is, Eve is deceived, which we just read. And you'll be led astray from the simplicity of Christ. Mm -hmm. and, and what is the simplicity of Christ? The simplicity of Christ is that he paid the price for our sins on the cross that uh, the simplicity of Christ is that he came for all people. He came for the rich and the poor. Right. He came for the white and the black. Right. He came from the lowly and the upwardly mobile. He came for everyone. There was, he's not discriminatory. That's right. It's not exclusive. And there are, there are, there are branches of Christianity on television today that people don't realize, in my opinion, are so deadly because they are, they have basically replacement Jesus theology. And it's not the Jesus that we read about in the Bible, although they point the scriptures. Mm -hmm. But isolating those scriptures out of context without the context of all the gospels, that uh, it makes Jesus look like a different person than what he's accepted okay. to be, you know, that we accept him to be. So read verse, uh, four. read verse four. For if one comes and preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you bear this beautifully. All right, so we're not to have another type of Jesus, even though his name may be Jesus, or someone that's, that's retranslating the scriptures to make Jesus whom, who may want him to be, mm -hmm. or a different spirit. Now, a different spirit will be not the Holy Spirit. And again, some of these things are reflected in our gut. We get a gut reaction. Something's not right here. 
Now, is any of us above deception? The answer is no. We live in our carnal bodies. We all can be deceived. There's no one that is exempt from it, but we are less exempt. We are more exempt from it to a greater degree when we have the Holy Spirit and we practice the witness of the Holy Spirit right. on a regular basis. And, you know, the, the, you, you know, that I, but anyway, we'll just keep going. So you want to practice the, you want to practice that inward thinking of that there is another Jesus. Now, now I'm going to talk about another of uh, the other Jesuses that people are preaching. They're talking about my Messiah and your Messiah. They're naming him Jesus or Yeshua mm -hmm. or the Christ, but they have a different viewpoint. And so I started out with liberation theology because that was the question. What is liberation theology? So I have six different Jesuses, if you would, that are being preached in pulpits around the globe today. And the first one that I'm going to deal with is liberation theology. Now, this is what liberation theology is. It is Marxism. And everyone agrees that it's Marxism. It's Marxism under the banner of Jesus to overturn uh, the society structures to liberate the oppressed and get rid of the oppressor. So initially, this started, it started gaining popularity in South America and Latin America, particularly in Catholic churches in South America. And not all Catholics agree with what's known today as liberation theology. Okay. All right, so I just, we don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater or bury a whole denomination. This is in Latin America, in specific areas where people are using, trying to bring in Marxist regimes, using the church and the people in the church. Wow to overturn a government to make it Marxist. And they use what's called liberation theology, and they say, well, Jesus would want you to, Jesus was poor, so uh, he came for you. Well, first of all, this, which is my, uh, my second one, which is the impoverished Jesus theology, I'm gonna tear that into that tonight as well. But Jesus was not poor, right. but we'll come back to that in a moment. But they use that, and this is the way this liberation theology works. Liberation theology divides people. It says you're oppressed and this is your oppressor over here. So we need to free you from your oppression and we need to deal with this oppressor. So the first way it was being used was in a financial circle. So the rich were the oppressors and the poor of the country were the oppressed. But remember, these are politicians using theology or twisted theology, twisted Catholic theology in order to gain their own ends to achieve a political goal. Okay. It's not a spiritual goal at all, but it, they come out making it look like it's, it's a spiritual goal. So what they do is they, uh, it's designed to make people take sides. So anything that's liberation theology today always has two sides. What's in the news in the United States these days? What are, we, what are we hearing about? We're hearing about the injustices to women. Mm -hmm. Have women been unfairly treated? Absolutely. But there is a theology growing out of Christianity that says that anyone who is oppressed is spiritually right for whatever reason. And we have a moral responsibility, no matter what the cost, to free those oppressed peoples. All right. So it could be it could be liberation theology financially. It could be liberation uh, theology according to sex. So if you're men, you're the oppressor. If you're women, you're the oppressed. So we want to free women from the oppressors of men, and we want to take men out of the uh, society's role of, as leaders. We want to make this a more gender neutral leadership role in society, including everything from families to. And nothing wrong with the woman being the head of the family. Nothing, and we're not saying any of that at all. But it's when it gets to the point of removing the rights of the male in order to so -called, relieve so-called the oppressed woman. Remember, this does only, it only separates people. Mm -hmm. It only makes people take sides. And, only, and it makes people, one person has to be in the right and the other one has to be in the wrong. It must be that way. There can be no, well, they might be, you know. So it's going on right now in our politics. It's going right now in our politics. What, what is, I mean, you can probably say it faster than I can. 
Uh, what, what, uh, the critical race theory. Critical race theory. Mm -hmm. uh, it's insane. Uh, um, what, what else have we seen in, over the past year uh, throughout COVID? What did we see on the news? And BLM. That, uh, BLM, right? Black you know. Lives Matter. What about All Lives Matter? That's right. Black Lives Matter, right? That is a liberation theology mindset. And we even had relatives sending me not you, sending me emails complaining about my theology that I was, I was an oppressor. They weren't using that terminology. Well, that's, well, that's, that's what critical uh, race theory is right now, and they're trying to push it into the schools. And they're saying that if you're white, you are the oppressor. And then there are different companies, of course, out there that are telling them to be, uh, their employees that are white to be less white, you know. Um, there are different companies that are pushing this um, critical race theory and, and it's getting really um, coming into the foreground now with schools and a lot of parents are seeing it because of the, co uh, and, and so really on the flip side of the coin, COVID was a blessing in disguise because a lot of parents suddenly were now taking interest in what the child was learning because the child was learning at home. Amen. And so they have to look at, and they're seeing, you know, they're pushing this, that, you know, if, if you know, I mean, well, a number one example is today the uh, House, uh, the House uh, voted in D.C. to remove all the Confederate statues in the Capitol Rotunda in D.C. I mean, we're, we want to erase our history, you know. These, these people that are long dead now are somehow the great oppressors, you know. But, but, the, but the thing, and, and they're pushing this mantra down everybody's throat. But the thing is there, I, I don't have any slaves in my past. There's nobody in my past family that's ever owned a slave. And I was never a slave in the past. And I'll bet that most of these black people and most of the white people, especially people that are pushing this, there's, there's no slavery in their past. I mean, yes, there was slavery. It was, it was in the whole world. And we've worked to, to take care of it and eliminate it. It's still going on in the world in different parts, but, but you know, there's, there's no appeasing some of these groups. And, and, you know, and when I watch the news, I grew up in Connecticut, and when I watch the news, I'm shocked that people make these sweeping statements about slavery when slavery was never legal in the North. Never. Right. I mean, it, it mean it, it, when you say, when we, we are talking about uh, laws in the North compared to laws in the South, the reason why the South wanted to break away was over the slavery issue. But it was only the rich and the powerful that had slaves, even in the South. The poor people in the South didn't have slaves. Right. right. And uh, so this whole slavery issue and the way uh, black people were treated and, and treated poorly in the South through the slave trade and through slavery in general was not something that was practiced up north. In fact, I didn't know what racism was. I had black, personal black friends. My black friends dated my sisters. And I had five sisters. We didn't think anything of it. I didn't know, I didn't know what racism was until I joined the military and I met a bunch of uh, southern whites and southern blacks. All of a sudden now, I'm hearing racism from both sides. But they were all southerners. Right. And, and I had plenty of black friends. You, you know, the, the people in the north uh, that were black, there was no separate bathrooms, there's no separate water coolers, there's no separate right. restaurants. It's, I never saw anything like that. Right, that didn't and happen so in the North. It didn't happen in the North, and so that, no one talks about that in the news. And that's not the point of our teaching here tonight. But liberation theology will pits one group of people, whether by race, by, uh, by sex, finance. by finance, uh, by anything that they can hook on in order to divide people, to conquer them, all right? So what they intend to do is take society structures and change them, in other words, get rid of them, but in the end, Marxism is, and in every one of these groups, they come out and say, we're using Marxism as a rule of thumb to help us identify what we need to liberate. And all of a sudden now, liberation theology becomes a movement mm -hmm. of people, not a movement of the gospel swelling the ranks of people going to heaven. It's just a movement of people. It's right. man-made right. and it's, it's demonic. So that's in a nutshell what uh, liberation theology is, okay? But 
the liberation theology makes Jesus, everyone says, well, Jesus was this, and he was this, he was this, he was this, he was this. Therefore, we have a responsibility to the poor. We have a responsibility to, um, you know, to the minorities in this country. But it's interesting that it's not my, uh, I just saw on the news today that Omar was criticizing Democratic Jewish uh, um, legislators. And she was mocking them, and now she's trying to backtrack it. So it's, it's only certain minorities that are protected. Jewish minorities in this country are unprotected, and whether right. they're Democrat or Republican. And so it does, it's, it's a select group of minorities that mm -hmm. someone somewhere uh, is picking, but it's not across the board. It's not even across the board. The second uh, theology I want to talk about is the impoverished Jesus theology. Uh, this I grew up with because I grew up Catholic. My father still believes this. My father almost became a priest. Went to La Salette Seminary out in Iowa. Was there for six years. Uh, got a revelation. Uh, I'd like to get married and have nine kids. And um, it didn't come to him all at once. I just like the kids didn't come to them all at once, but I'm the oldest of nine. And mm -hmm. so he, he got out, but he, to this day, my father really believes in this impoverished Jesus theology. And I don't, you know, I don't try to correct them anymore. Just, you know, that's right. what he wants to believe. Right. But Jesus was not poor. How do I know this? Well, first of all, he fed 4,000 and 5,000, which means if he could feed 4,000 and 5,000, he could feed himself. Uh, Jesus was was the head of his household. How do I know that? Because by the time his ministry started, his father, Joseph, his naturalized father, was dead. Under Jewish moral law, if you were a Jew, the oldest son got half of the inheritance. That means he probably owned the home that Joseph and him built. Mm -hmm. People say, well, he was born in, in a stable. He wasn't born in a stable because he was poor. He was born in a stable because there was no room at in at the inn. <laughs> right. There was no room. Right. They had money for a stable. And they had money for a hotel. They would have preferred the hotel. Right. right. All right. So they, he wasn't born poor. Mm -hmm. um, so and then think about this. We know uh, that Jesus had siblings. So what would the eldest son, his responsibility would have been? Would have been to make sure his siblings were well taken care of and fed. Mm -hmm. That was not Mary's job. That right. would have been his job as the head of the household and the man of the household. What else do we know about Jesus? He was the son of a carpenter. Well, back then, if you were the son of a, a wheelwright, you became a wheelwright. If you were a wagon master, you became a wagon master. If you were a camel herder, you became a camel herder. And if you were a carpenter, Fill in the blank. Right. Right? So you would become a carpenter. Exactly. And so Jesus wasn't poor. If he had a business, uh, we know carpenters out in our area, and we know uh, they're good carpenters. We hire them all the time. They are not poor. They are far from poor. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, so was he super rich? Did he act like a rich man? Well, let's, we can look at some scriptures. Well, you know, when he, when he was um, well, nailed to the cross, if you remember, his garments were right. very, very expensive his, and his very well made, and they gambled over them. So, right. so if they were rags, you wouldn't have yeah, 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 don't be giving up my scriptures. <laughs> okay. Let's go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians 8. Go ahead. And read uh, just verse 9 for me. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he, he became poor, so that you might, through his poverty, might become rich. All right, so if getting rich is wrong, and we're reading this just plainly without trying to interpret it through the face, uh, anyone that's anti-prosperity, uh, this would be a scripture that they'd want to throw out. They'd want to throw out the second half, but not the first half. But how did, how did Jesus Christ become poor? He came down as a human being and gave up all of his, for a period of time, he gave up all of his heavenly rights right, that's... to become poor, not poor, impoverished financially, right. but poor in the terms of spirituality and his authority and his power. That through his poverty or through his indignation, we might become rich. Amen. Amen. All right, so okay. that's generally what uh, people start out with this impoverished Jesus theology. Um, the, the funny thing is, is that all these people that generally believe this uh, generally make a lot of money. 
then they throw in a second scripture. Well, then it's the sovereignty of God that makes people rich or makes people poor. Well, well then if you believe that you were supposed to serve Jesus and he's impoverished, then you were supposed to be impoverished for your entire life. You should have been given right. away your money. Right. Right. So, so this, this stuff doesn't work. Um, let's go over to uh, John chapter 19, Kathy, John 19. Start reading for me. Verse 23. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his outer garments and made four parts, a part to every soldier and also the tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to decide whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture. They divided my outer garments among them and for my clothing they cast lots. All right, so one, one outer garment was torn into four parts we read here, but the other one was too expensive. And so they said, let's just cast lots and figure out who wins it. Right. All right. So uh, it, it, he's wearing an expensive garment. We know some other things uh, concerning him. Let's go over to um, Luke chapter Luke chapter 2 and read verses 40 and 47. 40 and 47. Okay. Mm -hmm. The child continued to grow and become strong, increasing in wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Now, we're not going to go over there, but one of the curses under Jewish law was poverty. If you were in sin, a curse could come on you that would impoverish you. Mm -hmm. All right? So poverty was considered a curse by all Jews. And the grace of God was upon him means... He wasn't lacking anything. Right. All right. So his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of the Passover. That cost money. Jump down to verse 47. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. All right. So not only is the grace upon him, but he's not, he's not dumb. And I've never seen any young, dumb girl, young, smart girls or young, smart boys that aren't already making a mark for themselves that you can tell is going to make a mark for themselves in society financially. Mm -hmm. Even though they haven't been developed yet, right? Right? They ha they're not in they're not in that 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 area. So uh, poverty is considered a curse. Jesus was the head of his household. Now let's find out something else. We're in the book of Luke. Let's go over to Luke chapter eight. Luke chapter eight. Luke chapter eight, and start reading in verse one. Soon afterwards, he began going around from one city and village to another, proclaiming and preaching the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and sicknesses. Mary, who was called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others who were contributing to their support out of their private means. So these were wealthy, 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 wealthy women, wealthy, mm -hmm. wealthy women, who were contributing support to the ministry of Jesus and his disciples out of their private means. And look at the term that you can just overlook, and many others. Mm -hmm. Verse 3, Amen. and many others. That's, he had a thriving ministry. Uh, there is a, let's go over to... I didn't write it down, but I found the scripture today. I should have wrote it down. Uh, that uh, he settled in the area of, 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 the, of Galilee, which means he, for a period of time, lived in a home. Whether he rented the home or he lived in the home, he settled there. And if you want to do a word search, and I, I should have wrote it down, if you want to do a word search, I'm, if you just type in settled, I'm sure you, you, people will be able to find that scripture pretty quickly, which means he's living in a particular area. So he's the head of the household. He inherits half, half the wealth of his family. He supplies for his brothers and his sisters. Uh, he's now in ministry, but he's not walking, or, he's not Gandhi. Right. This, is, this is the Son of God. So this impoverished Jesus theology, and we could go on and studying this tonight, right. but this impoverished Jesus theology just does not work. Um, look at, let's go over to John chapter 4, John 4, and read verse 8. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. All right, so they had money. Right. Let's go over to John chapter 12. John chapter 12, right? The disciples went to go buy food. So that means they weren't begging for food and they weren't begging on the side. They weren't preaching for money. Uh, John chapter 12, verse 6. Now he said this, not because he was concerned about the poor, but because he was a thief and 
as he had the money box he used to pilfer what was put into it. So there was so much money in the money box that Judas stole out of the money box regularly, Nobody and the only knew. person that noticed it was Jesus. That's right. how money, much money was in there. Jump down to chapter 13, Kathy. Chapter 13 and verse 29. For some were supposing because Judas had the money box that Jesus was saying to him, buy the things we have need of for the feast, or else that he should give something to the poor. So the money box is there. And then one last scripture while we're on this. I'm going to move on to the next one. Uh, let's go over to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew 4. Matthew 4 verse 13. And leaving Nazareth, he came and settled in Capernaum, which is by the sea in the region of Zebulun and Nath. Naphtali. No. Right. So, so right. okay. So he settled in Capernaum, yep. next to the Sea of Galilee. Right. Okay. So he settled there, which means he had money to live. Right. And he wasn't a tent maker. Although he, he was pre he was still preaching, but he had the money to live. He had the money to live on. This is why we support our preachers today. Right. It's because we need them to set aside. They don't. They shouldn't be out out doing the things of the world. They should be spending their time and study and prayer. That's right. And that's what their that's, that's what their exactly responsibility right. is, and and the prayer is to keep watch over everyone's souls. Right. And that's the point, you know. And you and I, we pray for a lot of people every single morning when we have, you know, I call them now our devotions, mm -hmm. uh, but you know, it's just prayer in the morning. Call them what you will, right? Mm -hmm. uh, how about the, the next um, uh, deception and false gospel is the and false Jesus is the false grace theology. The false grace theology is this: there's no judgment. There's no moral code. There's no preaching oh, yeah. of sin. You say grace and mercy. You say you know, grace and mercy, grace and mercy. It's a false grace theology. How many people preach that uh, abortion is wrong? I know there's preachers out there doing it. How many uh, people preach that, uh, that adultery is wrong? That living in, living in fornication is wrong? How many people are preaching any of these things anymore? The reality is, is that the majority of the church I sent out a letter today about living stones. The majority of the church are no longer the living stones of Christ. They the, say no, that not, they they're, are. They're not keeping watch over their people's souls. Not at all. Right. Um, case in point, right now we have the Catholic Church that has decided that maybe they shouldn't be giving communion to people that are pro-abortion. Shocking revelation. I mean... The church is pro-life. Why, why, why would you even have to have a little commission set aside to, to figure that one out? Right. Obviously, they're not following the church rules. I mean, the church, the Catholic church was against birth control. The Catholic church is against abortion. Um, but there is sexual perversion in the church, you know? So, you know, it's, it's, I was having this conversation with a woman today about that. She goes, well, wasn't the Catholic church like... Uh, pro-life and I'm like yeah they're pro-life they are they started the pro-life movement and I said but that doesn't mean that they're perfect they've got other issues out there and it's up to the diocese to decide what gets preached and and, and I tell you what it's it just like you and me and everyone else if um, if I have a tendency to be a pickpocket I'm certainly not gonna you know, slap someone else's hand for being a pit pocket, right? I mean, the same thing goes with any other kind of sin. You can I write turn that a down? blind eye to that. I, I gotta, can I write that down? Okay. <laughs> so I'm just, just saying. That's, okay. you know. That's good. That's very good. All right, so uh, the false grace theology. Let's look at a couple things that talk about this. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians 5. Okay. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And Kathy. It's getting interesting. Yes, it is. 1 Corinthians 5. Start reading in verse 1. It is actually reported that there is immorality among you, and immorality of such a kind as does not exist even among the Gentiles that someone has his father's wife. You have become arrogant and have not mourned instead so that the one who has done this deed would be removed from your midst. For I on my part, though absent in the body but present in spirit, have already judged him who has committed this as though I were present. Wow. Okay. So uh, the initial church was against sin. Look at, let's go over to uh, Galatians chapter 5. Galatians 5, verse 19. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, 
dissensions, factions, Keep going. envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. All right, so we see that uh, sin was talked about in the early church. How many right. people uh, read this and then teach on it in any depth? Mm -hmm. um, there is, uh, there's another one that I want to deal with real quick. And I, I'd like to come back to these next week because I think this is a good teaching. How about the false movements theology? And I'm just going to touch on this right now and we might come back to the false grace theology. How about the false movements theology? Uh, the false movements theology is this, and, and these are terminologies that I've come up with, but the false movements theology is this, that we're doing things to celebrate Jesus that Jesus never did, that his disciples never did, nor did the early church ever do. Like laughing? Like laughing, like rolling around on the ground and laughing. How about running around the church in a circle? Right. Uh, now there is a, there's a, another movement out, came out, I don't know, about five, six years ago. We were invited to one of the meetings that we actually went to, although I didn't know anything about it at the time. And uh, we went to one of the meetings back a couple of years ago in the summer and it, it, it started like in the Philippines or something, and now they have no structure, they have, they have no leadership, they've got no one that they call a mentor or a priest or a spiritual leader, but they gather together somehow through social media, and then they just dance and, and jump around, kind of like teenagers that are drunk. But they just shout Jesus and dance around, and they have, they have a whole t-shirt Men, you know, worldwide t-shirt that they identify each other with. They have uh, a flag that they identify each other with. And they're part of this Jesus theology. And they're just jumping around and they're going, I'm just getting in the Jesus and I'm just loving on Jesus. Well, you want to get in the Jesus, read your Bible. Mm -hmm. You want to love on Jesus, do what he said to do. But taking up time to jump around in, in, with uh, two or three or 10,000 other people. And the movement's becoming bigger and bigger. There are people in this area that belong to it. Right. And it's it's actually uh, it's that is a source of pride. Here is and I'm going to come back on this next week because this is a great place to drop it. Pride is what tells people they can join these. And you go, well, how does that work? Pride comes to you. I'm I'm the person coming to you and I go, how would you like to join a superior group of Christians? We got the cutting edge on Christianity. We started this new group. It's moving all around the world. And if you join us, you'll be joining a superior group that only certain people feel they need to join because most people, are, they're, not, they're not spiritual enough to understand what good oh, we're doing. Oh, wow, that's a good one, not spiritual. And so when I'm telling you that and I'm inviting you, your pride is going to say, not yours, but your pride is going to say, well, I want to be superior. I want to be in the superior leading group. I want to be like Jesus. I want to be on the cutting edge of Christianity and spirituality. And pride mounts up, and then you get involved into something that involves dancing, hopping, just general goofiness. And it's pride. It's pride that allows uh, to get there. There's other things that allow you to get right. into false movement theology. Another one is sin, and another one is this carelessness. Things I'll cover next right. week. But if I can tell you, if I can flatter you, I can get you to join anything. Right. I can. Right. I mean, I, I can, personally, I couldn't do that. But I know people that have got no conscience that are excellent flatterers, and they can flatter anyone into believing mm -hmm. anything or joining anything. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, and then uh, next week, I'm going to talk about the uh, false. Uh, prophecy uh, theology, and then all the, the other one I'm going to talk about is all religions lead to the same God, which is a false theology, but it's in Christianity today. Well, all religions lead to God. Well, then you don't understand Christianity because right. Jesus said, I am the door. No one comes to the Father but through me. That's right. That's right. I, you know, and so uh, we'll come back to that. Okay. Is that okay? Yep. And then I'll let you uh, interview me here and, and we'll talk about the other subject that we wanted to talk about. Well, we just kind of want to take some time here in the next few weeks to just um, kind of give a lot of people that are new to the ministry and people that have been in the ministry for a lot of years, people move around, people move away, um, just to kind of give you a, a, an inside track, what's kind of been going on, what, uh, what, what ministry is like and things like that. A lot of people don't know what ministry is like. But um, so we're going to talk about that and just kind of so a lot of you can get, you know, grasp of the 
of the history of this church. And also, um, it's, it's it, been it's been in, it, we've been like well growing and maturing. I don't want to use the word evolving, but we are ever changing and ever adapting. But you know, mm -hmm. um, but the vision is the, the is vision the same. is the vision there. Has stayed it's, the same. It's huge. Yep. And so um, today, I just wanted you to talk about uh, was there anything. I want to talk about miracles because this ministry has had thousands and thousands, thousands of miracles, of thousands. Um, both for us, both for the ministry, both for the people uh, that we serve, our church family. And we, we hear about it, um, that people that are watching us, mm -hmm. um, people that are uh, here in the sanctuary. And we, you know, so I, I just think that's exciting. And just the, the fact that this ministry is still alive and booming is a, is a big testimony as, as well. Right. Okay. So let's start with, um, we were uh, at the X Auto Parts store that we... Where um, Famous Dave's is now. Right. We, you know, mm -hmm. renovated it on the inside. It looked pretty, pretty dingy on the outside. It looked like a dump, but... Um, uh, we were uh, pushed out of there uh, quite quickly. Well, we were at the um, uh, Kenneth Copeland uh, ministers meeting, mm -hmm. and we got the call. Mm -hmm. Hey, guess what? You got 30 days to get out of there because <laughs> we're, we're pulling the lease. We bought the building, and it's mine now, and we want you out. Right, and they were calling us from Florida. They weren't even yeah. local yeah. people. They so were, they were was, investors uh, from Florida. Right. Yeah, that was a, that was a horrible uh, phone call. It was a horrible afternoon. Um, so do you want to uh, elaborate on that? Sure. Um, uh, God spoke to me several times audibly about where he wanted this church to be, right. and he said, I want you in the Dells, which is a half hour drive from our home. So that didn't seem logical. And I mean, it, you know, it didn't seem logical from a man's perspective. Of course, right. from God's perspective, it was completely logical. And then God spoke to me and said, I want you on the interstate. So right. we were on the interstate in that auto parts building. We, we were. were right on the interstate exit. Right. People driving right past our building, getting off the interstate. Right. And uh, so we were pretty much on the, but then the Holy Spirit spoke to me one day and said, I want you to call up your favorite realtor and ask him if there's any real estate on the interstate. <laughs> uh, so uh, I called him up. He goes, actually, Dave, I got one. He goes, you've got to come out and see. It's 36 acres. I go, okay. So we go out and we come out here. Mm -hmm. And the guy that owns the land lives down in Louisiana. And he owns three or four parcels on the interstate uh, where some buildings are now where uh, he owned. And I think he still owns a piece of land if he's still alive. So uh, I said, how much do you want for it? He goes, 600000 <laughs> Now, this is in 1998. Right. No. We didn't have six hundred dollars. We didn't have we didn't have twenty five thousand. So anyway, um, I I said, well, neg negotiate with him. So he calls me up. He said, Dave, the guy wants to talk to you. He's a Christian, and he's a, he he gives to his his local church down there in Louisiana. He wants to talk to you personally. So he talked to me for a half hour on the phone. Then the next day, I got an offer. He'd sell it to me. And we talked, because we talked about these ideas. It wasn't just right. him coming, because I, I, I offered him, you know, why don't you give 400000 of it and get a tax write-off? I, I wanted to figure out how his business was doing. He said, he's making so much money, he needed tax write-offs. I said, great, I know how to do this. So I said, why don't you donate 400000 and charge us the 200000 and we'll sign a contract. And he got a big tax write-off, and I, we started paying him. And then at one point, he goes, God, he calls me up and said, God told me to pay off $35,000 of your loan. I go, great. So all of a sudden it dropped. And then about a year and a half later, we were closing in and paying off the whole $200,000, you know, including his donation. And he said, God told me just to write off the note. And we had like $25,000 left on it. So all of a, within, I think, 24 months, we owned a $600,000 thousand dollar piece of land which was valued at six hundred thousand right. in 1998 uh, when he was when he was trying to sell it then so we didn't develop it it was just down the road that we have now that's a third of a mile long it was that was a, a trail for deer mm -hmm. you couldn't get I had an old rusty pickup truck that I would risk driving up to here because it would try to take off the mirrors and anything mm -hmm. I didn't care because it was all rusty pickup truck it was fun to drive in the woods so I would, if I would come over here, I would have to drive that pickup truck just to get back to this location, right. which was not open. We had trees here. 
And then so they, they said uh, on February, whatever, February 20th, get out. You got 30 days. And so I thought the ministry was over. And then uh, I, I think I talked about this just a couple weeks ago. I, I drove around. I thought the ministry was over. I, I just, we tried to find another location. We couldn't do it. And the Holy Spirit said, build a building. Mm -hmm. I said, build a building. So I called up a guy that I used for architecture. He, he designed other buildings for me. He's a, he's a very good architect. And I said, design me a building. You got 30 days to come up with a design. So him and I worked hard at it during this period between February and April. And we got a design, which is what everyone is seeing right now. We designed this in 30 days with state conceived uh, things in place. And then I went out and I contracted it. And we got a giant contractor out of Madison to agree to do it. And I didn't even have financing for it. Right. And the initial part of the project was supposed to be 750000 And then it ended up, you know, and we put in, I don't know. We, as we were building, we started building. We're two weeks into the building. And the contractor comes to me and goes, Dave, you're a nice guy. You're a good guy. You're a nice guy. How are you going to pay for us? We've been out there working for two weeks. We've already run up a quarter of a million dollars. I go, you know, I haven't thought about that, but I'll go to the bank. <laughs> this is true. Yeah. Uh, I, just, I just knew that God was going to have control. It was just falling into place. So I, I went to the bank, and I walk in, and, and my banker was a woman, and we were good friends. And I said, uh, I, I said her name, and I said, you know, um, we're building a, a big church building out there on our land. She goes, Dave, I already heard about it. <laughs> she goes, I know what you're doing out there. I go, okay, well, can you lend us the money? She goes, yeah. I didn't even have the plans with me. I just walked in. I didn't have nothing. She goes, yeah, come back on Friday. We'll sign the paperwork. We'll get you $750,000. Boy, banking changed. Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so I, I called the guy up later on that day. I said, yeah, we'll have the financing by Friday or Monday. So we'll start cutting you checks. And then, uh, then it began to rain. This is 2004. It began to rain all over the entire central part of the state. So much so that the big contracts were stalled because they couldn't get into the sites. They were all muddy sites. So 120 men showed up one day from all these different jobs with this one big contractor to work on a job that only had six men assigned to it. That's right. And they were, they were plugging away. I have pictures of them walking around tripping over each other, trying to get stuff done, working in the rain because they wanted to work. Mm -hmm. these, are, these are craftsmen. They all wanted to work. Then the building got built in 90 days with state approval. The state the state guys came out. One guy, short, heavy set guy, big belly. He had veins coming out to here. Short, crew cut, mean as anything. And he's cussing at the workers, going, Do this today so I can approve it and not come back. It was 50 days? Okay, Kathy just corrected me. It was 50 days. That's true. It was 50 days. And um, so. And we moved in. I mean, it wasn't completed, but we moved into the church at 50 days. It was state it approved. Was some, it was habitable. The bathrooms were done. Right. It was I mean, state we approved. We the carpet. And it was state approved. And these guys, all these state inspectors are running around yelling at people. And, you know, it's, it's a job site, so it's a little bit crude. So, and I'm going like... And I go, I go, do they normally act like this? I go, are you kidding me? You've got to hunt these men down. It'll take them 120 days normally to get out to a site to inspect it. Right. I said, they're running all over us. We've never had them do this to us before. And then they were telling the contractors how, how to put in the plumbing, how to put in the, the wellhead, how to put in the, the, uh, the well container, how to put in uh, so many different lines that were we, being yeah, put in. Yeah, we had so many... Uh, so much favor and so much blessing, and it was just like it was just overflowing. It was overflowing, it was, and we moved it was in. Awesome. In the first day that we got in here, for those that were here, I had a shofar, and I just blew the shofar in the sanctuary. I don't know for ten minutes. Right. Our first, and everyone um, was shouting and screaming. No one could believe that we had moved in that quickly. Right. It was just Our first Bible study was held out where the parking lot is right now, everybody sat on bales, right? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and it wasn't raining, so that's good. Uh -huh. But um, it, it was just a, a, just a really cool, you know, we, I mean, we had some hiccups here. I mean, for you women, one of the hiccups we had was that we ordered pink interior walls for the stalls. For the ladies' rooms. Ladies and they, room. Yeah, and they didn't have that color, so they just put in coral, and we're like, uh, but it's not pink. 
well, that's what you got. What do you want to do? And we're like, well, we want to have a bathroom, so we'll, leave, we'll keep yeah, it. Yeah, they, they offered already to take them down. So, we, so it, it looked uh, really uh, wild in there because we had like a brilliant shade of pink and in this coral, it was just like obnoxious. <laughs> Oh, the things that you women go so, through. So yeah, we yeah. we painted to make it work, but uh, yeah, we had a couple hiccups, you know. Of course, you do, but right. uh, and, and last week I talked about uh, the contract to go on television, and that was just right? supplied for. Right. Uh, what it, what was interesting during this construction time, we had over six hundred thousand dollars in cash come in. Six hundred thousand in fifty days. Once people found out that we were building. People came out of the woodwork and just were writing out big checks. Our parking lot, which is valued in the driveway, and the grading and the and the and the the fill was all done for free, and it's about three hundred thousand dollars worth of parking lot and grading and driveway, and that was all donated. Right. Donated. Amen. And so it was a blessing. It, 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 we should have had you know our 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 finish our finished loan should have been around one point five million. But only ended up being, I think it was eight hundred forty thousand or something like that, the finished loan, because we had so much donated in such a short period of time, and yep. it was it was the hand of God. That's right. And, and, exactly and right. it was, and it was small givers too. Small givers were just like given two and three and four times a week. I heard what you're doing out here. Here's here's twenty five dollars, and then you would see them two or three times again, and then maybe over the next couple of weeks or next month. Just here, I know it's not a lot of money, but here, we want to give to your building project. And these are people that don't even go to our church. Right. A lot of people they gave were other, were other churches, other church people that would probably never want to come here. Mm -hmm. But I think some of them watched us on television for the little bit of time that we were on TV and for you know five years that we were on television at that point. Yeah. So, yep. but it was, it was absolutely wild. Yeah, it, it, was, it was. And the first day here, it was, this place was jam packed. It was wild in here. Yeah. It was crazy. That's right. That's right. So. We don't have time for anymore. We don't have time for any more. But, but uh, next week, we're going to talk some more about the uh, false gospel theologies, and we'll do, we'll do another interview next week. Okay? Okay. All right, let's all Sounds stand. Good. Father, we thank you for your word here today. We give you honor and glory and praise. Father, we thank you for what you're doing in our lives. Father, I ask that you give me a great message for your people for this Sunday and that uh, all of our congregation and all those that peer into our ministry, even momentarily, yes. will have a great weekend and a great rest weekend and a great rejuvenation weekend. Yes. And Amen. Father, we thank you for this study here tonight. We thank you for your people, uh, Father God, and we ask that you'd give them their daily bread continually, not just today, but daily and every day in Jesus' name. Amen. So this is Pastor David and Kathy saying, Press into God. And he'll press into you. And we'll see you again here this Sunday at, at the, the mountain. mountain.